We are blessed and thankful to the Lord, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to study His Word together. Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10, as we have noticed, is all about the choosing and the sending, that initial internship of the twelve. What we're going to be doing, what we did last week, what we're going to be doing today is simply meeting these apostles. So let me read to you these verses, Matthew 10, the very beginning, verses 1 through 4, and then we'll jump into our study this morning. Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 1, and he called to him his twelve disciples and gave to them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. And the Lord bless the reading of His Word. What is remarkable about the apostles is that they aren't remarkable. These men, at least initially, are, are just normal men. These are men who would be chosen by Jesus to be His authorized spokesman, to be the foundation of the church we just heard read to us moments ago, who performed amazing signs and wonders, who authorized the New Testament. These men who accomplished fantastic things, in fact, providing the foundation upon Jesus Christ for the very church. These men were normal, run-of-the-mill, unremarkable fellows from all walks of life. What set them apart was not their qualifications or their personal giftedness for the job. Rather, what set them apart was the triunially, triunially devised choice by Jesus Christ. This divine choice is what made these men remarkable. There's a lesson in that, isn't there? In fact, I want to read to you a little bit of Luke's account Luke gives us a little bit fuller of a description of the choice that Jesus made of these 12 men, gives us a detail that Matthew doesn't give, or at least doesn't elucidate on. Luke 6, verse 12 says this, And these days he, meaning Jesus, he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them 12 whom he named apostles. Now, Matthew doesn't mention this triune prayer meeting, but he does clearly say that these men were chosen. They were called by Jesus Christ, chosen by Jesus to be his apostles. And the reason I mention this, along with the fact that Jesus' choice of them was a result of this all-night time of prayer with the Godhead, is because I think sometimes when it comes to the apostles, we, we may get caught up a little bit in the, the biographical details of each one of these fellows. And certainly there is merit to walking through these men and studying them. In fact, I can recommend to you several books you can look at and just study each one of the twelve apostles. But the point here is not so much about them and what they would accomplish and who they are and their personality. The point is that Jesus chose them. Jesus is the focus of this drama here, not these men. At the same time, I do think that the people would have understood, especially the group probably of maybe 100 or 200 people that were technically his disciples that had been following him, from whom Jesus chose these 12, they would have understood some things about these men whom Jesus named. And so, yeah, sort of the latter half of this morning's message, we're just going to walk through each one of these disciples. I don't want to spend too much time. I, I saw several preachers would spend three, four, five, seven weeks even going through each one of the disciples, the apostles, one by one. And again, I think there's merit to doing that. However, I think that wouldn't be in tune with what Matthew's trying to do here. He's just pointing out whom Jesus chose. 
And that's what we want to do today, to look at these men and find out a little more about these men whom Jesus chose and authorized on his behalf. Well, that's essentially the theme that we looked at last time, that these men were indeed authorized by Christ to speak on his behalf. They started out, they were called essentially to conversion, to to follow Christ, to be sort of lowercase d disciples. Then they were called to true discipleship. It wasn't that they were just called to sort of generically follow Jesus or sort of get in the club or in the team and sort of, you know, culturally appropriate some of the things that Jesus and his followers do. No, it was to be genuine disciples. And we, we saw that a few weeks ago or months ago when we studied Matthew's own testimony, how he stood up and walked away from his uh, nefarious tax collecting. They were to be radical, true, genuine disciples of Jesus. So that was sort of the second step, that not just they follow Christ from a distance, but they follow Him closely, become genuine disciples. And now we have the next step, and that is a unique appointment, a unique calling. The first two calls, in a sense, are what God calls the whole world to do, to to follow Christ, and not just to follow Him generically, but to follow Him with genuine, radical discipleship. But this call is different. It's specific. It's unique. It's authoritative. And Jesus, again, bestows upon them his own authority. We see that in the very language that's used here in this this small passage. It's using the same language that it was used to talk about Jesus just in the verses earlier in chapter 9. These men had the authority of Jesus himself. And so last time we answered that question, question number one, what is an apostle? The apostles are the men chosen by Jesus to come alongside the prophets, essentially, be ministers of God's revelation, to speak on His behalf. They came alongside these men, the prophets of old, who gave us the Old Testament. They were specifically chosen. They were proven and tested as genuinely chosen by God Himself to speak on behalf of Jesus. We'll see this play out in the lives of the apostles as you study the the Gospels, and then as you move into even Acts, and later on you find out that God did indeed confirm that calling. It was a true calling. Jesus calls these men to this great task. Well, after He calls them, He begins to really focus His attention on these men, training them, discipling them. Essentially, if you start even before that, He essentially He spent three years pouring into them, direct teaching, teaching to large crowds, teaching them by His example, teaching them also by, by sending them out. He, he gave them little short, little miniature mission trips, day-long trips, you might say. He, he'd send them out to, to sort of get their feet wet in the job that they would be doing for the rest of their lives. And so they learned didactic, didactically from Jesus. He sat and taught them. They learned through His example, and they also learned by experience. And then later on, when Jesus goes to heaven, He sends them out permanently. They're prepared. They're ready. And he sends them out, Matthew 28, Acts 1, officially as his representatives. And he did exactly what he told them that he would do. He brings to their minds the things that he taught them. They put it down. They codified the teaching that he had given them for three years. They wrote it down. They inscripturated it, if I can use that word. They, they put it in Scripture, and that's what gave us the New Testament. So that answers that first question, what is an apostle? These officially chosen, validated men chosen by Jesus, authorized to be His spokesman. He gave them authority, it says. How do we know He has? They had His authority. Again, they had the same signs that He gave them, much like God would give the prophets of old signs. You think of Moses himself, God giving them signs to validate that they were indeed spokesmen of the Almighty. So that answers question number one. What is an apostle? Question number two is what we're looking at today. Who were the apostles? Who were these guys? Like I said, it would be good maybe for you to go and study. There are, again, a number of books I would recommend that you could study and learn about the apostles, go through each one of them, find out what church history says. And there's there's things about the apostles that are not uh, in the Bible. They they just happened in history, and they were recorded and, and passed down through the centuries. There are important things that we can learn about these guys, uh, parts of their testimony, their, uh, the way they all essentially were martyred. 
It would be important to do that. But I do just want to touch on them because I believe that's essentially what Matthew's doing here. He's not giving us a long biography of each one. Instead, he's just, he's just pointing out whom Christ chose. And I think, again, those who followed uh, Jesus in a sort of a broad way, the, the little D disciples, that group of possibly 100, 120 people following Jesus around, those people perhaps would have known who these guys are, and, and that's why I'd like to just touch on each one of them. They would have understood at least a little bit about these men, and so that we can do the same thing, we can understand these men. That's what we're going to do on here in a second. These men, again, are men chosen and called to accomplish much, but they are normal, finite, frail humans just like us. They make mistakes, but because Christ's work in them, they have become the foundation of the church. And again, this is comforting. It's comforting, I'll say this, it's comforting not just from an individual perspective, but but even as a church, it's comforting. The common thinking today is that in order for a church to have an impact, in order for a church to, to really make an impact in a community, it has to be big in number. This was just 12 guys. It has to have many people. It has to have highly influential people. It has to have wealthy people. It has to have very highly gifted people, people gifted with leadership and, and speaking. It has to be full, full of people of, of a high level of gifts and power and money. That's sort of the lie that's given to us today about church. And yet God founded his church on 12 very normal, unremarkable guys. The kingdom is not built on something that would highlight man's giftedness. It's not built to highlight man's power or money or influence. God takes the weak things, the small things, the little things, and uses them to build His church. I wrote down 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. God chose what is foolish of the world to shame the wise." God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. The issue is not the glory of these men and how great and how powerful and their influence and their money and their giftedness. The issue is God himself. It's Christ's empowerment of them. And this is factually true for the apostles. The only guy in this list that may have had significant wealth was Matthew. But other than the fact that he was a tax collector, and oftentimes tax collectors, because of their extortion, were wealthy, we just sort of assume that he was wealthy. He may not have been wealthy, but he could have been wealthy. That's just a guess. These guys were just normal guys, not wise, not powerful, not wealthy, not elite, not influencers. These guys were not men with great power, and this is how God grows his kingdom. Again, the remarkable thing about the apostles is that they weren't. Now, before we look at this, fellows, fellows, I want to say a couple of things that will help us along the way as we look at how Matthew put these down. There are four times in the Bible that the apostles are listed, four times. Matthew here, Mark, Luke lists them. John does not list them, but Luke repeats his list in the book of Acts. So four times, three in the Gospels and one in the book of Acts, the three synoptic Gospels and the one in the book of Acts, we have the list of the apostles. Four lists, and it's the same 12 guys every single time. There's no confusion. The early church didn't scratch their head and try to figure out, now who are the apostles again? I don't remember. People were very clear. They knew exactly whom Jesus had chosen. In fact, It's interesting, Jesus didn't just sort of pick these 12 guys and go off and let them know sort of privately. It seems like there were many people around. It says, we read it in Luke, he gathered all his disciples. So from the very beginning, when he chooses these 12, he picks these 12 from among a larger group of people. And from the very beginning, people understood exactly, precisely, whom Jesus had chosen as his apostles. There was no confusion about these guys. These four lists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts, these four lists, each one of them is divided into three groups of four. Each one of these lists has three groups of four. Each gospel writer, and then Luke twice, lists three groups of four, and each time it's the same 
group of four apostles. And it's in the same order in terms of the grouping. Now, the, the people are not necessarily, the underneath are not necessarily, but each leader of each group is put at the front. And so you have these three groups of four apostles each. So again, the order may vary a little bit from gospel to gospel. You have Peter, and the same group of guys are listed after Peter. You have Philip, and the same group of guys are listed under Philip. And then you have James, son of Alphaeus, and the same group of guys are listed under James Alphaeus. Now, this fact may tell us that they were organized. Maybe, maybe they sort of organized themselves in a certain way. And, and you, you think this because these men were responsible for putting the Gospels together. And so when it came time to, to list whom Jesus chose, they did it in a certain way each time. They did it with these three sort of group captains, and underneath you had the same groups each time. And perhaps they organized themselves this way. They, they thought of themselves this way. In fact, if you look at each group, it seems like there is indeed some organization there because clearly that first group, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, that, that first group seemed closest to Jesus. In fact, you could even take it a step further. The first three, Peter, James, and John, seem uh, really to be closest to Jesus. So following that logic, that second group, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, were not as close to Jesus, though they were apostles, though they learned from him, though they're around him a lot more than anybody else on earth except for those four ahead of them. They were close to Jesus, but not as close as that most intimate group. And then that final group there, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simeon, Judas, well, they, these are the most distant of course, Judas is last. He's always last in all the list for obvious reasons. He's the most distant from Jesus. The first person, of course, like I said, is always Peter, and that's because Peter himself was closest to Jesus. In fact, you can take it a step further. It's Peter who is likely the leader of the apostles, the spokesman of the apostles, we don't just say that because he's listed first, but if you look at the language there, look at verse 2. The names of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter. Now, that word first can mean chronologically first, but Peter was not chosen chronologically first. You have to find out why would he say first Peter. Now, he'd say first, comma, Peter, or first Simon, because he was indeed the chief. That word first can mean chief or leader in fact, that word is used, Paul used, when he talk, calls himself the chief of sinners. Peter clearly is identified as the leader of all the disciples. He's at the top of the list. He's closest to Jesus. He's probably the oldest of all the disciples. May have been the only married man at the time of choosing. It's not any surprise to them that he is the one who becomes a spokesman at Pentecost. He is their, he is their leader. He is the spokesman. He's the one that speaks out the most. He's the one that's the boldest. I believe he's the one that perhaps has the strongest faith and the strongest level of understanding. Now, again, I don't want to put too much emphasis on the organizational factors here, but I do think this will help us understand how these disciples thought of themselves, how Jesus chose them, how they framed it when they listed themselves. In fact, if you look at these three lists, these three groups of four, you do figure out pretty quickly it's that first group that's most intimate Jesus that we know most about. The second group we know a little bit less about. And the last group, other than Judas, we know almost nothing about. Now, that's essentially how they organize themselves, and that's how we can think of them as Jesus chose them and perhaps organized them. All right, let's do a little, little overview of each apostle. Again, I, I, I could spend a month of Sundays going through each one and sort of uh, deducing all kinds of things about their personality traits and what lessons we can learn from each one. And again, that might be a beneficial study, uh, perhaps even a Bible study you could do something like that. But I think the reason, again, that Matthew put this in here, just so that we'd know who they are, whom Jesus chose. So I want to give you just enough that... Perhaps if you were among those, that larger group of disciples, you would understand who these guys are, the, the basics about these guys. First is Peter. Peter, formerly named Simon. Simon was his name until Jesus changed it to Peter. He called him Peter. 
Peter is from the Greek, which means rock. Cephas is the same name in the Aramaic, means, means rock. And of course, we'll look at this later on in chapter 16. Jesus gave this name to Peter to demonstrate the kind of faith and confession that Peter made of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Peter, we know best. There's most information about Peter in contrast to the rest of the apostles. Peter, we like him because he seems to waver the most. He seems to stick his foot in his mouth the most. Some people say Peter is the apostle with a foot-shaped mouth. I think we can all identify with Peter, some of us more than others. There's no disciple who's more confronted, more shamed, more embarrassed, more humiliated than the apostle Peter, but there's also no uh, apostle who is more praised and more recognized. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And Peter tried to convince Jesus to avoid the cross. Peter wimped out in front of a little servant girl, girl, denying Jesus three times. Peter sunk in the water when Jesus had given him permission to come out and walk on the water. Peter cut off a guy's ear with a sword, really a brash effort to kill the man by the name of Malchus. Peter's failures are always visible, but at the same time, Peter was also the boldest, the most ready. Peter understood Christ, and I believe he probably had the strongest faith of all the apostles. You know, everyone sort of mocks Peter for for sinking on the water, going out and losing faith and sinking, but don't forget where the other 11 were, sitting in a boat doing nothing. Peter at least got out and walked. He was more bold, he's more forthright, more ready than all the other disciples. Peter heard of Jesus' resurrection, and he and John, and John being the younger man, beat him to the tomb. But Peter didn't stop. John stopped at the, the mouth of the tomb. Peter rushes straight in. Wasn't afraid of any of that, wanted to see his Savior, Jesus Christ. Peter was active, he was an initiator, he wasn't afraid to ask questions, he wasn't afraid to be involved. You get to the book of Acts, and the first half is really of Peter's leadership. He's all over the place, and everywhere he goes, there's great miracles, miracles similar to Jesus' miracles, powerful miracles, powerful preaching and teaching. Peter was probably most like Jesus than any of the other apostles. Like I said, Peter was married, and we know this from an earlier look when Jesus went to Peter's house of his mother-in-law and healed her and then began to heal many people there in that house. Peter was a fisherman. His brother Andrew was also a fisherman. They lived there in Capernaum. In fact, uh, scholars, archaeologists believe they have uncovered Peter's home. They think it might have been his home. He was not rich by any stretch of the imagination, but he did well. He did okay. He probably had a business. He'd been around, again, being a little bit older, he'd been around for a while, and plied his trade well, his brother and perhaps others working for him. He was successful as far as fishermen go. So that's who Peter was, named an apostle. Who's next? Well, it was Andrew, his brother. Matthew tells us Andrew. Andrew's always characterized as Peter's brother. I imagine he got sick of that from time to time, but I don't know that. I remember when I first went to college, my uh, two older sisters, I have three older sisters, but two of them had gone to that college, and, and the first year, my freshman year, people kept on telling me, oh, this is so-and-so's little brother. Got a little annoying after a while, wanted to be my own man, not some girl's little brother. Now, it seems like Andrew's defined like that a lot, Peter's brother. There is something interesting about Andrew, and that is this, Andrew is always bringing people to Jesus. We don't see much of Andrew. Andrew, maybe logically in terms of his distance to Christ and, and the amount of times he's mentioned, may fit in that second group better, but he's, but he's always in that first group, probably because he's Peter's little brother. But there's maybe another reason is because this man loved to bring people to Jesus. He brought Peter to Jesus. He goes to, to, to Peter and says, Peter, we found, or Simon, we found the Messiah, and takes Simon to Jesus. Then we see Andrew in John chapter 6 verses 8 and 9 doing what he does best. He he finds this boy 
who uh, the people were hungry, and this, he goes out on the crowd, and he finds this boy with a couple little fish and a couple little loaves, and, and it seems like Andrew is convinced that Jesus could do something with this. It seems like Andrew may be the only apostle of all the apostles that believes that, that Jesus can do something with this boy and his, his little loaves and fish. And so he, he brings that little boy to Jesus. Then in John chapter 12, Philip comes up to, to Andrew, and he's got some Gentiles with him. And what does Andrew do? Andrew says, let me take these Gentiles to come see Jesus. What a great heart, a wonderful man Andrew is, brother of Peter, who loved to bring people to Jesus. The next two fellows are, are also fishermen, like Peter and Andrew in this first group. These men are fishermen as well, James and John. James, son of Zebedee, it says. We might know John better, but James is always listed first. In fact, even if you've been a Christian for very long, it sounds a little weird to say John and James. You always think in terms of James and John. Because that's what it says in the Bible over and over, James and John, these, these brothers. And it's probably because, again, James was the older one, and James was certainly the more outspoken of the two. James was a very, very bold man. Jesus called them Boanagus, which means sons of thunder. These men were bold, James being the bolder of the two. And I think James was probably the boldest of all the apostles. And the reason I believe that is because later on when Herod decided in the book of Acts to persecute the church, he doesn't go after Peter, he doesn't go after John, he doesn't go after anybody else. He goes after James and kills him. One of the, if not the first, martyr in terms of the apostles. This is a bold man, James is. James was there when a huge group of Samaritans... Uh, chased all the apostles away from their village, probably stoning them, probably throwing rocks at them. And James runs back to Jesus. They come back to Jesus, and James is the one who said, you want us to be like Elijah and call down fire from heaven and burn up those people? This man was powerful. He was bold, probably a little bit angry. This man sought justice. There are several Jameses in the Bible. This is not James the Lesser, whom we'll look at later on, James of Alphaeus. This is not James, the brother of Jesus, who wrote the book of James and pastored the church there in Jerusalem. This is James the Apostle, though James the, the bold one, James the outspoken, James the strong. And that's no wonder that he was martyred first. John, his brother, probably had a lot of the boldness in him, just as James did, but he seems to be a little bit more balanced. So that's the next apostle Matthew lists for us. John. John was fiery and bold, but he did have some level of balance, I believe, with this idea of love. John loved love. He talked about love. He spoke of love. We studied, a couple of years ago, we studied the epistles of John, the three letters that John wrote. John, in fact, was the longest-lasting apostle it's like in some ways the opposite of James. He lasted the longest. He, he wrote a lot of the New Testament, the, the, the Gospel of John. He wrote the three letters, and he wrote the book of Revelation. These men were bold, but John seemed to be the one who had a little bit of love. These men knew their position, and they were bold, James and John. I think they came by it honestly. We'll tell a story later on about James and John's mother arguing to Jesus that these two men ought to be top in the kingdom, sit on his right and left-hand side. But I think John was a lover ultimately, not a fighter. I think John was the one. I think, think of them as boys growing up. I think John was the one, the little brother, who would, would run up as the fight got started, as James began to throw the first punch, and, and he would grab his brother and hold him back. I think that's what John's role was. Though he was bold, though he was authoritative like his brother James, he did temper it with love. I was reading a commentator this week, and he said there was a Roman coin back in that day. On one side of the coin, there was an ox. In fact, both sides of the coin, there was an ox. On one side, it was an ox facing an altar, and this ox was, was beautiful and adorned, and it was going straight to the altar to be 
sacrificed. On the other side was an ox that was out in a field and it had furrowed a, a long row to be used year after year after year. Well, the commentator said this puts in his mind the idea of James and John. One loud, brash, obvious, used up, burn up quickly for the service of God. The other one plowing the field, lasting all the way almost to the end of that first century. John Wood indeed lived the longest among the apostles. He served all the way from Jerusalem to Ephesus, ended up in Patmos in exile. He, he died there a martyr, and not necessarily a martyr being executed, but a martyr dying in prison. John had invested probably more than any other apostle, even more than Peter, any, any other apostle in terms of that first century. People knew John. Probably the most impacting ministry of all. All right, I spent the most time on those first four because we know them best. They're the most obvious ones. Let's keep moving so we can finish sometime before three. Philip. This is not Philip the deacon who you meet in the book of Acts, the evangelist. This is Philip the disciple, Philip the apostle. Philip is always first in the second group of, of four uh, apostles. He may have also been a fisherman because we see him later on uh, fishing with some of the, the fishermen disciples. Philip is sort of like Andrew in that he seemed to be seeking the Messiah before Jesus even showed up. Philip is a man who seemed to be searching and inquiring. He seemed to be a, a Bible study student. He seemed to be a Bible student. He seemed to be someone who kind of thought in terms of the Messiah's arrival. Perhaps he took note when John the Baptist began to preach. Again, you can read about Philip in John's gospel, and there what we see about Philip is he, he, he learns of Jesus, he sees Jesus, he hears Jesus preaching, and he immediately goes and tells another fellow, that they found the Messiah. Now, that next guy that he goes and tells is a fellow by the name of Bartholomew, or Nathaniel. Bartholomew, or Bartholomew, or Nathaniel. A lot like us uh, today, these, a lot of these guys have multiple names. If you just compare and contrast the different lists, you understand who's whom. Nathaniel or Bartholomew seem to be interchangeable. Nathaniel, again, was a student of the Word, much like Philip was. He was a man of character. Jesus says he's a man, a, a true Israelite, a genuine man of faith, a genuine man of integrity, without hypocrisy, without guile. And though at one point we see him a little bit narrow about, he says something about, can anything good come of Nazareth, out of Nazareth, he does seem to be a man who believed and followed Jesus from start to finish, a, a blameless student of the Word. That was Nathaniel. That was Bartholomew. Next guy, Thomas. Poor Thomas. He gets a bad rap, doesn't he? We all think of him as doubting Thomas because he says, after Jesus was resurrected, until I see the scars, I, I'm not going to believe that he's truly resurrected. But Thomas wasn't just a realist. He wasn't just a, a skeptic, which isn't always, by the way, a bad characteristic. I think some of us could use for a little extra skepticism. No need to believe everything we see. And this was Thomas. He did have some skepticism, but that wasn't the only thing about him. It was Thomas, when the disciples were getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, it was Thomas who realized what Jesus was doing and where he was going. Thomas seemed to, to have a very analytical mind, probably why he became he was sort of a skeptic. He had a very analytical mind, and he had done the math. He had, he had figured this thing out. He realized Jesus was going to die. And he's the one that spoke up to all the disciples and says, let us go with Jesus to Jerusalem to die. Unlike Peter, he didn't want to go there and fight to the death. He was ready to lay down his life as a sacrifice. He understood what this, this following Jesus, denying himself, taking up his cross, he, he understood what this meant. I always kind of wonder if Thomas is up in heaven wagging his head saying, Man, well, I wish, how come people don't remember me for that statement, not the doubting statement? Let us also go with Jesus that we may die with him, he says. 
Thomas was a realist. He knew Scripture. He'd listened. He'd done the math. Jesus, I'll die right alongside with you. Speaks to our need in the church, I think, as we look at even these first few guys of different personalities, different gifts, complementing gifts, not sinfully expressed, uh, contradictory gifts. That's when gifts don't fit, when we're sort of sinful in our giftedness. These men complemented one another. Next man is a man we've already met, Matthew, also called Levi. If you want to go back a few months and listen to that message, you can. We can learn a little more about Matthew. Matthew, again, don't let really say much. He was involved in organized crime, the organized crime of tax collecting. It was uh, criminal according to uh, the law of the Jews. And then he had all sorts of, everyone knew this was a very corrupt uh, industry, the tax collecting industry. And the thing we have etched in our minds, what we studied again a while ago, is that Matthew immediately stood up, left his collection booth. He's a picture of the cost of discipleship and abandoning everything to follow Jesus. This is what Matthew did. Matthew was a true disciple. Well, now we've made it to the final group, the ones most distant from Jesus, the ones whom we know least about, with the notorious exception of Judas. At the, top, at the top of the list of the group is James, son of Alphaeus. Nothing about him in the Bible. No quotes, no activity. The only thing that we have is that he was James, not the prominent James, James the lesser. Not James, son of, son of thunder, but James, son of Alphaeus, James the lesser. In fact, that word lesser could even be translated a little. And some people have gone on long chapters, written books about how James had <clears throat> sort of an insecurity uh, complex. He felt he was small. Uh, I don't know that that can be proven from Scripture or from anywhere else for that matter. But little James, James was the man, James the lesser, we don't know much about. Thaddeus, also called Judas, parentheses, not Iscariot. And you even see him defined that way. Judas, parentheses, not Iscariot. This is the same guy as Thaddeus. Thaddeus, or Judas, not Iscariot, or sometimes Judas, son of James, as opposed to Judas Iscariot. Again, nothing in the Bible about Thaddeus, nothing about this man, Judas, not Iscariot. We do have one quote. He says, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And uh, I read a lot about this. There, I think scholars are divided on what exactly he means by this and what can we know from this uh, Thaddeus fellow, what, can we can, what we can know from this I think is pretty scant, so I don't want to speculate. Simon, another man where there's very little told about him, Simon, it says Simon the Zealot, which possibly means he was involved in one of the sects. There were uh, different groups in Judaism. One of the groups was called the Zealots, and these, these Zealots believed that they needed to overthrow the Roman government. Different groups dealt with the Roman government issue, the Roman Empire issue in different ways. Some felt like you work with them. Some felt like you, you contradict them, but you don't fight them. Some, like the Zealots, felt like you ought to fight them. And they actually... Uh, were known for murder. They would actually take knives around. In fact, I've been told that the, the word zealot ultimately comes from people who would carry around these little daggers and kill people, their, their political enemies, in crowds. We don't know if Simon was involved in any of that, but it's possible that he was in that sect of Judaism. Again, abandoning it all to follow Jesus Christ. The end of the list, of course, is Judas Iscariot probably the most hated man in all of history. The betrayer, the turncoat, the false disciple who faked it for many years and then for just a little bit of cash sold out the Savior. We'll study him more at the end of Matthew. His name is Scariot. That is debated. Possibly means a place, a nearby place from which he came, but we don't know for sure. Some people think it was added later as a word of derision, but we just don't know. We'll study him more at the end of Matthew and the, uh, the passion of Christ, but to suffice it to say, but suffice it to say that Jesus' choice of Judas was not the result of an accidental slip-up. It was the result of prayer and a decision by the Godhead. 
This was an action taken by Jesus. Jesus knew. When you read the book of John, you realize Jesus knew he was choosing the very one who would betray him. All part of his plan. Let me mention a couple of others just to uh, sort of close the idea of disciples, answer some dangling questions. Some of you ask, what about Matthias? I mentioned Matthias last time. The early uh, 11 apostles, once Judas had died and betrayed Jesus and died, there in the first chapter of Acts, they choose this man named Matthias to replace Judas. A little bit of debate. I kind of go back and forth between the sides of the issue. Some say Matthias was a properly chosen, recognized, authenticated. Clearly, we have the authentication there, read. Uh, he was this, he was this, he, he filled the role. Others say, no, he was prematurely chosen as that, that 12th disciple. Now, the 12th disciple would be chosen by Jesus later on, and that disciple would be, that apostle would be Paul. This was uh, a mistake. So in favor of Matthias being a true apostle, simply the fact that nowhere in Luke's account there in Acts is he said this was a mistake. It doesn't say that there's a slip up, that they messed up, that they chose him prematurely. Even when it gets to the discussion of Paul, it doesn't say, now this is the one that was supposed to, they were supposed to wait for. Luke gives us an account. There's no commentary whether it was right or wrong there, so we can't derive that from that. Against the idea that Matthias was prematurely chosen is that the apostles should have waited for Jesus to personally choose someone. All of them had been personally chosen. It's clear that the apostle Paul was personally chosen. Acts chapter 9, Galatians 1, 1 Corinthians 15, Jesus chooses and appoints the, uh, the, uh, the apostle Paul as is indeed one of his apostles, lately coming. So this side of the debate says the appointment of Matthi- Matthias was premature. He's not genuine. Right now, I think I lean toward that latter argument, though I could be convinced otherwise. I think for a couple of reasons. One, the apostles seem to, to believe, there in that first chapter when they chose Matthias, they seem to believe that 12 was an important number. You notice that they, they had two candidates, and they didn't just say, oh, yeah, anybody, oh, there you're in. They felt like there needed to be 12. That seemed to be a number that was important to them. And, of course, we there are sort of apocalyptic things that you have to consider in the book of Revelation when it comes to the number 12. Then we also see that nowhere in the Bible did Jesus personally choose Matthias, though we do see this with Paul. Jesus personally appointed him to this role and task. But again, if you believe that Matthias is a genuine apostle, I don't think there's any danger in believing that. Uh, I may switch before today is over, so good arguments on both sides. Were there other apostles? The word apostle, again, simply means sent one, and so we see the word apostle being used in relation, not direct, not in terms of appointment, but used in relation to several other people. Andronicus and Junius come to mind. Barnabas comes to mind. James, the brother of Jesus, comes to mind. But I just think it's pretty scant evidence to include them as apostles when we have this very clear here in the Gospels three times and again in the book of Acts this this choosing and listing this very clear identification I think the Bible would be very clear if these other fellows were apostles so I think there's Jesus's special choice of 12 minus Judas plus Paul whom Jesus made the foundation of the church and these are the ones that the only ones I like to use the word apostle for. These are the men upon whom our little church, way out here on the opposite side of the world, I think we might be exactly 12 time zones. I'm not for sure on that, but I've got a buddy in Jordan, and he's exactly 12 time zones from us. We're literally on the other side of the world in the middle of an ocean. These are the men upon whom our church is built. Their testimony what they inaugurated there in that first century, what they started, the the church, what they initiated, all the words that they give, the instruction, the rest of the the New Testament. This This is the foundation of the church. And we become the proclaimers of the truth that they also preach. We we look to these men, along with the prophets, whom God officially designated as his spokesman. 
We believe when we open the words that they wrote down or, or authorize the writing of. We, we believe it's not them speaking ultimately. It's God speaking. And we study their words not as though they come simply from a group of motley fellows who lived in the first century. We study these words as though they are the Word of God because that's what the, the New Testament and Old Testament really is. These are the men who teach us, these are the men whom we are dedicated. And of course, this is exactly what it says about that early church. They were dedicated to the apostles' teaching. Now, let's dedicate our hearts to the truth that God used these ordinary men to speak to us directly even today, many years later, on the other side of the world. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you did something extraordinary with some very ordinary men Ultimately, you gave us your word. Ultimately, you gave us these truths. And Lord, these truths teach us of Jesus Christ. They attest to the fact that Jesus himself, the Son of God, came to this earth and provided his life and atonement for sin. He was crucified and rose on the third day. And Lord, I pray that this gospel message, the message that was first given to us by Jesus and then the apostles, this message will plant itself in our hearts today. I pray for those who don't know you that the message of the gospel would plant itself in them. Show them that they are sinners. Show them their need for the truth of Christ, that He is the only one who merits salvation. He is the only one who paid the price. His blood atones. And He is the only one who rose victorious over sin and death. And so, Lord, I pray that they would reach out in faith and trust in Jesus Christ, repenting becoming a disciple, following Jesus, much like these men initially did. Lord, all of us need the faith and the strength. You inspired these words of these men. Lord, they wrote many other things, but these things that were put down for our benefit and for your glory, Lord, we look to them because they, they are your words spoken on your behalf, men chosen by your choice. Lord, I pray that your truth would be planted deep within us. You would shape and fashion us for your glory. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen.